Most of us will have experience with dementia. Some of us professionally, or more commonly, on a personal level. One in 20 of us will develop dementia by the time that we're 65, and two in five of us will develop dementia by the time that we're 85. It's relentlessly progressive. The speed at which it progresses will vary from person to person, but the end result is the same. It will get worse. It can go beyond just the common perception that it affects short-term memory. It can affect people's speech. It can affect people's ability to recognize people and faces. It can affect fine movements and coordination to the point that it's difficult to even get dressed, do buttons up, use the toilet without assistance. It can alter people's personalities and markedly increase their risk of other mental and physical health problems. For most mental disorders, we have treatments available both pharmacologically and psychologically for mood disorders, psychotic disorders, anxiety disorders, even for addiction. When it comes to dementia, we have got very little. We have some medications that if you give them early enough, might slow the risk of progression for some people, but even then, their success rate isn't huge. And a lot of people don't present and get diagnosed until they're much beyond that window of opportunity and the disease is much more advanced. So a couple of weeks ago, when the FDA approved a brand new drug for the treatment of Alzheimer's called aducanumab, the brand name is Adjahelm, the world got very excited. But then when you just look beyond the headlines, the excitement turned to, at least in the scientific and the medical community, bewilderment. A course of treatment costs over $50,000 and according to the clinical trials, it doesn't work. So why was it approved? On this video, I wanna to talk to you a bit more about what Alzheimer's is, what the rationale is behind this drug and why it was hoped that it might provide therapeutic benefit. We can then think about the trials that look to see whether it does work, spoiler alert, it doesn't. Alzheimer's disease is the most common type of dementia. There's lots of types of dementia. You may have heard of other types like vascular dementia, Lewy body dementia, frontotemporal dementia. Alzheimer's is a neurodegenerative disease. And by that, I mean, obviously when you get into adulthood, your brain is fully developed. And then at some point, your neurons start degenerating. That's different to a neurodevelopmental disorder, which is where the brain forms in a different way in the first place. Like every psychiatric disorder, we have some, but a very incomplete understanding of how the disease actually works. But one thing that we do know is that there's proteins that can accumulate both within neurons and outside of neurons that can lead to an inflammatory response that we think is why the neurons die off. And then we get a loss of a chemical in the brain called acetylcholine. This is a neurotransmitter that helps one neuron communicate with another neuron. We know that acetylcholine is important in memory formation. So it's the loss of the neurons and the loss of acetylcholine that we think is what underpins how Alzheimer's manifests. Now it usually starts with a loss of short-term memory and that's because it affects a particular part of the brain first. This is a brain bought on Amazon for like 20 quid. Oh, it's magnetic, very fancy. Here's half a brain. We know the brain is made up of multiple lobes and one of the lobes here is called the temporal lobe. Now, if we look at what's called the medial part of the temporal lobe, I don't think that was meant to happen. <laughs> what have I just lost? I think I've lost some cerebellum there. It's fine, we don't need some cerebellum. We can do without it. So, <laughs> We've got the medial part of the temporal lobe, medial meaning closer to the midline. So this is the midline of the brain. So we've got half a brain here. So this bit here is the medial part of the temporal lobe, okay? So in the medial temporal lobe is a structure called the hippocampus. This is important in memory formation. The hippocampus is important in short-term memories, but also then helping those be laid down into our long-term memory. And what we know is that the hippocampus, actually more specifically a structure around the hippocampus called the entorhinal cortex, is the bit that's first affected in Alzheimer's. Inside the neurons is a protein that's called tau. Tau is really important normally in kind of being the scaffolding for the neurons. Problem is, if that tau accumulates in an abnormal way. These set off a bit of an inflammatory cascade. The neurons die off, and we also think that that inflammation spreads outside of the neurons and causes these plaques to form outside the neurons. These are made from another protein called amyloid. This folds in an abnormal way called beta amyloid that we think then magnifies this inflammatory response, causing more tau to form, which causes more beta amyloid to form, which causes more tau to form, more beta amyloid. And along the way, we lose more and more and more neurons. And that neurodegeneration spreads beyond this medial temporal lobe to affect lots of other parts of the brain too. And that's where you get the much more diverse features that we associate with Alzheimer's, such as difficulties recognizing people, recognizing things, fine movements and coordination, speech, attention, personality, loads of different things can then be affected. 
Most of the medications that we've already got focus on trying to boost the amount of that chemical that we've lost, acetylcholine, by stopping it from being broken down. So whatever's left can then sort of persist in these synapses for longer, being allowed to do more communication. Problem is that's reliant on enough acetylcholine still being produced in the first place. And in advanced Alzheimer's, we've usually lost so many neurons already that there isn't much there to begin with. So it doesn't matter if you're gonna stop it being broken down, there's not much there to start with, so you've got nothing to work with. So we need something new, and that's where this new drug aducanumab comes in. This is designed to try and clear this protein that we find in the extracellular space that forms those plaques, this beta amyloid. Thinking that if we get rid of that, we try and stop this inflammatory cascade and we try and stop the loss of neurons. This drug is given once a month, intravenously for 14 doses. And then for those people that respond, they may be eligible for more treatment beyond that. Now, if we look at what Biogen actually say, they say the accumulation of amyloid beta plaques in the brain is a defining pathology of Alzheimer's disease. In clinical trials, Adjihelm reduced amyloid beta plaques by 59 to 71% at 18 months of treatment. Okay, so it reduces and gets rid of the beta amyloid. Does getting rid of the beta amyloid really matter to patients? Or actually, is it more about improving memory improving function and day-to-day -day quality of life. Is beta amyloid really the cause of all of these problems or is it more just a marker of a disease state? Reducing beta amyloid as an endpoint for studies that have looked at whether this drug is effective makes no sense. We should be measuring the stuff that actually matters. Measures of cognitive impairment and quality of life. Fortunately, in the phase three trials that actually looked at whether this drug was effective, that's exactly what they did. Yay, go science. We have the Emerge and the Engage studies. These are two randomized phase three trials. Effectiveness and safety, that's what it's all about, right? The EMERGE study showed potentially a little bit of benefit. There was a statistically significant improvement in markers of cognition in those that had been given this drug aducanumab versus placebo. Though that being said, statistical significance does not equal clinical significance. So it doesn't actually mean it makes a meaningful difference to the human being. And it only worked in those people that were over the age of 70 and had at least one copy of a particular gene that we know in older age increases our risk of Alzheimer's called ApoE4. The ENGAGE study showed no benefit. No benefit. That's not gonna be good at selling drugs, is it? Right, so we've got to now kind of pin down and look at specific people that we recruited and see if it works just in the smaller group of people. I.e., let's cherry pick some evidence and manipulate the numbers. And that's what they did. They decided to then do a subgroup analysis of only the people that had received all 14 doses. That was only about 24% of their original number of participants. And that showed a slight benefit in that there was a reduced rate of cognitive decline in those that had aducanumab compared to placebo. So that was similar to the other study. So they went, oh, maybe it works. That's not how science works. You can't cherry pick evidence like that. Now, fortunately, the Drugs Advisory Committee saw through that and went, na 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 na, don't you dare do that. And they pretty much unanimously said there's no evidence that it works. And given the huge costs of this treatment that actually so far seems ineffective, it should not be approved. Yet the FDA did. It's baffling. So this is what they said. Treatment with Adjihelm was clearly shown in all trials to substantially reduce amyloid plaques. Well, yes. And that this reduction is reasonably likely to result in clinical benefit. Yet the two studies showed that it didn't. So it was approved, but with the requirement to undertake a much bigger, what's called phase four study. And this needs to be done by 2029. So we've got another eight years where we're potentially, or at least in America anyway, they're potentially given this expensive, ineffective drug that did have some side effects for some people of increasing neuroinflammation in the brain. My best guess, and I don't know the answer to this, is that one thing that we perpetually have a problem with in neuroscience is that animal studies show, oh wow, there's this potential new drug, this might actually have a benefit. And then we trial it in humans and then it leads to no benefit. That's been the story of our last few decades in neuroscience research. Translatability of findings from animal studies to human studies is just non-existent almost. And because of that, whenever pharma have tried to invest and they've gone, wow, we've got this next good new treatment, look, we've got these animal studies that work, it then gets trialed in humans and it fails. We're back to square one. It's a huge investment to come up with a new drug. So then pharma have gone, well, there's no profit in this. So what's the point? I suspect this is kind of a big, relatively expensive ploy to try and get pharma to keep investing into new potential treatments for neuropsychiatric and neurodegenerative disease and trying to convince them that it's not a complete dead end in terms of potential profit. Now we haven't got this drug in the UK yet, and I really hope that NICE do not approve this. And quite frankly, that money could be much better used for other parts of Alzheimer's treatment, including optimizing cardiovascular risk factors, and probably more importantly, proper social care.